Um, I'm Asunta Charles and um, I work as the humanitarian program manager for Oxfam Nobel. Uh, but at present, we, I'm also taking care of the country manager position. I'm also filling in both the positions, so I'm doing both. Basically, I'm a development worker. Um, but with Tsunami, I just shifted my focus to humanitarian. Okay. And I just wanted to broaden that scope. That's where I landed in Afghanistan with, with Oxford Nobel because I was already working in India for Oxford Nobel. Then where are you from? It, You're from India? Yeah, I'm from India. So then making that shift became really possible uh, because Oxford Nobel is now strengthening the field offices. Uh, in 2000 and, in 2008. They, you came here? Yeah, I came here. Then started setting up the field office and recruiting the national staff and those initiatives were taken up. And as of now we have a good team, around 13 people. So that's where we started. Yeah, it's two years that we have the uh, field office. So what is your daily work all about? What do you do all day long? Um, basically, we, uh, as you know, Oxfam Novel doesn't work with, uh, implement directly any of the programs. It, we always work with partners. So most of the time is spent on um, discussing with partners. Like uh, when we take up a program, we also do a kind of a regular monitoring. Uh, that happens at different levels, like at the head office level where we interact with partners in, the, in their organizations, try to understand how the program is progressing and what are the challenges. And we also have the national team which takes care of the field monitoring when, when it becomes difficult for the expats to travel. So, yeah. uh, if you would have to name two or three of the biggest programs mm -hmm. you are running right mm -hmm. now, yeah. What are they about? Um, under humanitarian, we have one big program on nutrition, like it is a community therapeutic care program, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, funded by UNICEF, and it is it's covering four provinces. Uh, that is uh, one of the biggest programs that we have, and uh, we are under humanitarian. We also have a focus on preparedness, uh, which is covered by disaster risk management programs. Uh, that is also implemented in five provinces by six partners. So these are the major province, uh, programs we have. Now we have also initiated, uh, we had a study on uh, school, school edu uh, girls' education, and based on that we felt that there are a lot of dropouts and one specific learning that came out, and uh, which was also uh, uh, more or less justified by UNICEF's research was that uh, menstrual hygiene is really lacking in the schools where um, most of the girls drop out or there's a lot of absenteeism in the schools. So that is one model that we are developing now under humanitarian where we are taking up menstrual hygiene awareness in schools. That's a model being developed uh, in uh, collaboration with UNICEF and Ministry of Education. I mean, Afghanistan, if it comes to education, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just disastrous. Huh? Many yeah. people say it's the worst country in the world regarding the uh, educational system, and not only after Taliban, mm -hmm. also before. Uh, what are the biggest challenges, in your opinion, when you, you look into this education system? Of course, I think girls are one to yeah. get them in there, but. Yeah. What are the others? Uh, one thing like in rural areas, if, if you look at the family economy, like most of it, it's, it's so much, uh, poverty is so much a big issue. So families don't really educate the children. They, most of the children are becoming child laborers, like, because uh, ultimately people ha need food to eat. So their immediate need is that. So in that way, they really don't look for any other um, better option rather than uh, sending their children for work. So that is what that is main reason that I would say. And secondly, even from the government, I don't know how much of focus is there on, uh, on education. 
and even the capacity within the government, the funds available. So these are some of the factors that um, don't really help uh, people to be educated. And apart from that, if you look at, um, if you link it to link education to employment, and if you look at the wider range of employment opportunity, it is only the NGO field. If NGOs are really withdrawn, there will be a really a big disaster in the country. There won't be any job availability for people. So, so for many people, if education also links so much to employment. So if there are no employment opportunities, people think, why should we study? So ultimately, they decide that they can do some menial job and take care of the family rather than getting educated and being jobless. And even if you have to see the NGO field, it's only those who can speak English are employed. Mm -hmm. So it's all these complications that really make the education sector a big, like there's, there's a kind of a question, what are we doing? Okay, so this is also one of the reasons there is this huge lack of teachers here? Yeah, there are teachers plus the quality of teachers that we have. There may be teachers, but uh, what type of education do they give? What, what do you need to do to become a teacher here in Afghanistan? See, they, they have teachers training institutes, um, but basically in today's, even when I was sitting uh, in the meeting, I realized that many of them really do not have that basic kind of uh, uh, understanding or they may know the syllabus but how to teach the children, what are the methods of teaching the children, how to make it more interactive, what is the creative way of attracting the students. It's something that is really missing. Mm -hmm. So education, like you, you cannot just say like you have the theory. What is ultimately needed is to get the attention of the students. So if you, are, if you fail to do that, then you are not really doing a better job for the students. So even though I, the, this is my like first education project here in Afghanistan, but from few interactions, that's what I realize. Like maybe there is um, number of teachers is one thing, and one other thing is like what type of how are they trained? Like you no, know, basically what will be the what can they deliver? That mm -hmm. is where the biggest problem is. So how can you see? I mean, this great idea project is is actually. If you look at the telecasts, if you look at this mobile kind of thing, it's a pretty high-tech mm. uh, abroad for, mm. for a country where internet isn't an issue. I mean, it's just not available, or if it's available, we don't mm. have the bandwidth we actually need. Yeah. Uh, uh, where do you see see the, the, the moments where technology can really jump in and become helpful? See, even if you look at the use of mobiles, it is also, it's not a very, um, like, a common technology. It came very recently. But if you look at, uh, if you walk down the streets, if you look at anybody, everybody has a mobile. Like, no, but this is Kabul here. How is it in the areas around? Like most of the areas, that's what, even when I went for a field visit in interior Samanga, people are used to telecom, uh, used to mobiles. And um, I have also tried because for monitoring, I have used this mobile as a uh, technique to get details from people, to talk to people in the field. So people are having mobiles and maybe the coverage can be uh, a little bit of a problem in the in interior areas, but you cannot say absolutely there is no coverage. So mobile is reaching there. So at one point, people also want something innovative like no they don't really want normal things to happen they they really look for something that can help them that can motivate them so in that way i think um, technology can can play a major role and i i would always refer to the use of mobiles and and nobody really taught how to use a mobile it's already people it's transferring from one person to the other so if something interesting happening i'm sure it ge it gets transferred very fast and you don't need really people to sit and teach them yeah. especially the kids i mean for the teachers it's a different story yeah, yeah. Probably but the kids will get along yeah they because they are so curious to learn things and it's it's always that they don't um, 
it's I always find that it's adults that um, feel that they should not make a mistake but children it's always that even though they make a mistake they want to try it out so that curiosity that's what helps them so I don't think with children it should be a problem uh, but both this somehow again uh, separate the girls from the boys as far as what I heard mm. that girls are not allowed to have mobile phones it can have a because now things are changing like no it's it's like maybe what i feel is like we have very kind of a conservative idea about certain things here in afghanistan and that's what we are spreading broadly so but i don't think that is that is what is really happening in afghanistan this is wasn't also the thing i what i've been you know seeing the last week so hmm. Because I have seen a lot of girls using mobiles, so also young girls. Yeah, young girls. Like, so I, I don't know whether we are um, we are not exploring things properly before we, before coming to a conclusion. That's where I'm 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 a little bit wondering, because it's not so rigid. There are things happening. Like, no, uh, um, I have seen girls using the mobile, so it's not like girls are not allowed to use mobiles. And how do you use it? Is the other thing. Like if it is for for a purpose of education, I don't think even families will be will be stopping it because most of the families now look forward to sending their children to school. Like at least in Kabul, like cities like Kabul, they also take them, send them out for studies because now more and more they are realizing the need for education, and that kind of a, because they are getting exposure to different countries, different people living here. So there are also changes. Like so, we cannot be very rigid with our thinking that nothing is happening. Like people are really, really very straight. I don't think mm. because even when you when you when you just glance through the shops here, the costumes that you see. It's amazing. The advertisements are amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I always wonder whether anybody will wear those dresses. Even coming from India, I don't think I. I, we will wear those dresses in some places because in South I don't think yeah. we will wear those dresses. But here people are making those dresses, and I understand they are using it for weddings. Those dresses, yeah. which are very expensive, very uh, fancy kind of dresses. So very colorful. Yeah. So very I think we have to also really uh, do much more analysis of what is happening and what changes are coming. I don't think we we are really in a very very kind of an old the ancient age where things things don't remain that same. Mm. Things keep on changing. Mm. So there are changes happening. So you're now starting this this pilot there in in Parwa. Why yeah. is it Parwa? It's a good question. <laughs> like uh, most often we choose projects in an area where our partners have a presence. and also where uh, we have a good coordination with the government when especially when we work with the government because it becomes very essential so we also look at the coordination mechanisms that are existing and uh, where our partners are strong and they have a program and they have a field presence and the security okay because most of the time when models are developed it needs a lot of support from the supporting yeah. organization managing organization so in a place if it is not accessible then you cannot do that kind of a monitoring yeah. so then it becomes really really essential for us to take mm. those aspects into consideration so from a oxfam point of view what what are your expectations on this project one thing is like uh it it needs to be um when i say it needs to be a success it's not like a uh in a report but practically things should happen that sh we should really be able to assess the impact from the students what are the changes it has made and whether it has met the needs of the people because basically this project has been developed based on needs expressed by the students so we have to also see whether those needs are met and in case if we feel those needs are met then then i would say that uh, that's really a uh project that needs to be uh, replicated in other provinces so basically i would see what I, what impact it has created um on the students with whom uh, this project is involved 
and what is the change in the teachers because basically if you are saying teachers should be should, should be in a better position to deliver better products then what are the changes that have taken place in the teachers mm -hmm. and ultimately how is the family looking at it looking at the whole process whereas, whereas that is making a uh, making the community to dis make a better decision to send the school children to the schools ultimately that's what i would look at it maybe if the uh, education is attractive i'm sure many more children will be um, looking forward for this education so maybe all this can be better factors to assist. So the partners here, I think it's actually a very, very diverse group. Yeah. <laughs> the people we met this week. Uh, is this the usual crowd you're working with? Different partners, you mean? No, the partners who sat on this table. Yeah, we uh, our partners are not always on the same level, like capacity-wise, their experience. There are a lot of varieties and um, basically partners also have different capacities and uh, uh, sometimes you, you see that one partner who can do better education program uh, is not, not a very good, um, can have no good delivery at the health sector. So these differences are there. So because our focus is also not like one sector, we are also taking care of different other sectors. So our partners also are chosen based on that criteria. So we have a variety of partners with whom we work. Are you also thinking about like when you use now these uh, mobile phones uh, later in the pilot, uh, even though we are talking about education, we are talking about I think six to eighth grade or seven to ninth grade mm. science education. Are you considering right now that mobile solutions, the experience you have there, could also be very helpful maybe in health? Um, actually, we are, uh, as I told you already, like we are trying to see like whether that can be a remote monitoring mechanism that can be used for Oxfam Norfolk. Um, at the communities because we can have direct access to the communities and get better feedback. So it can also be done for health programs or some other programs that we are doing. Uh, because health I see a better scope because if people can, uh, because there is also, a, I don't know how it will work, but at least from India I know there is a helpline like you can call immediately and you will, you will get the services like ambulance and other things in a, uh, but I don't know, it may take some time for Afghanistan to reach that stage because looking at the uh, status where we are now. But uh, there are possibilities of utilizing this uh, this uh, service as part of other programs that we are in, uh, implementing. But immediately what I can think of is uh, try and see whether this can be part of our remote monitoring mechanism which is very, 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 very much needed in Afghanistan. In which other countries have you personally been before with development aid? Uh, I have been spending most of my time in India, but uh, I have also worked uh, for uh, uh, training the students in Canada. I was there for uh, for a year where I was training students on development. This one, it was an inter. Um, uh, it, uh, it was an exchange program between Canada and India, so I was training the students. Plus, uh, plus I have taken up some evaluations in Bangladesh and training programs in Nepal. It's part of my um, consultancies that I have uh, taken up these things. So what makes Afghanistan here so special? Is it all about the security thing or uh, how would you, if you have to make kind of list, on, on cultural things, on economics, on education. Where would you put Afghanistan in the world? Uh, because it has a real uh, a rich cultural heritage. That is, yeah. that is really a great thing. And, um, and uh, the people, the hospitality that people have, that is something that I would really consider as the richest thing of this country. Um, and one more thing like uh, the traditional joint family system which still exists because many of the countries, you, including South Asian countries like India, which used to be um, really um, familiar with this, now they are losing uh, this kind of uh, systems. 
but what I find here is still these traditional systems are very strong and uh, that that is something that very rich here okay. those traditional practices maybe they have their pros and cons but I would feel these are some of the riches that contributes to the country but above all the Many people really want to work in Afghanistan. It's it's not only because as expats it's money, but it is also the based on the need because it's so much people are in need. And actually you you can do a lot of things here. But most of the time it becomes so difficult for you to carry out these things because of the security. But uh, looking at the country, working with people, I always feel there is there's such a lot you can contribute and um, and especially uh, if you are a development worker and you see a lots and lots of potential especially for employment for women you can do a lot of things which we are lo losing that momentum but there are a lot of possibilities here so how do you see the development this would also be my last question how do you see the development of the country um, I, I would say like uh, maybe I I, uh, I I may sound a little um, pessimistic here because there's a lot of uh, dependency that we have created. So uh, we should be aiming at some kind of a sustainability, building the local capacity where even if suddenly NGOs leave, there's sufficient capacity to handle issues. That's where somewhere I, I think we have failed. We have created a lot of dependency. So starting from employment, starting from all other um, activities implemented, uh, people still depend on NGOs, INGOs. Like if there is an emergency at, at this point of time, uh, I don't know how much capacity is there within the government to respond, within the local NGOs to respond. So ultimately, it comes back to the INGOs. So which I see as a development worker, I wouldn't see as a positive a positive thing happening. I would see more and more people should be able to, self-help is the best help, that's what I always believe. Help people to help themselves. Yes, themselves. But that's what somewhere we are missing. Okay. Would you consider the government as a kind of stable thing? Uh, it's it's really that is where the whole problem lies because ultimately government should be the one who's taking care of most of the activities that NGOs are doing and at one point I also think government should be in a position to question and also challenge the NGOs but it's the other way around uh -huh. as okay. of now so maybe the best thing is to really increase the capacity of the government so that government is the people are beginning to trust the government. As of now, that trust is really missing. So people people have, have very little faith on the, the government. government. So that is where the change should start with. If the government can do everything for people, then I think things will change much more. People have more trust in the government. And they know that it's their own government. They can demand things. They can do things mm -hmm. with the government. Mm -hmm. So that is where we have to build the capacity of the government. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>